Should you buy a line TBC or a frame TBC or both? I'm going to conclude uh, in this video that you definitely need a line TBC, but I've come around to the view that maybe you don't need a frame TBC. I'll explain why. Before diving in, just some quick context. There are about five call it major ways or common ways, or sometimes not so common ways that people uh, digitize analog tapes. The first way, and that's the one we're gonna be talking about today, is where you start with a VHS player or maybe a high eight camcorder. You pass the video signal through a line TBC device, although this is optional depending on whether or not your VHS player has line TBC. Then maybe you pass it through a frame TBC device. Then finally it goes to the capture device and then onto your computer using capture software. So that's the first way. The second way that people digitize is starting again with a VHS player or maybe a Hyatt camcorder, connecting that to a mini DV camcorder, which takes the signal, digitizes it as a DV file, sends it off through a Firewire card into your computer software. The third way to capture analog tapes is with an analog to HDMI device, like the RetroTank. It takes the analog signal, it converts it to a digital file, it exports or it outputs through an HDMI port, which then you can either connect to your TV to watch it, but in our case, what we wanna do is connect it to an HDMI to USB device that connects to a computer and that the OBS software uh, captures that signal coming through. The fourth way is with a tape player and recorder, either an all-in-one device or uh, two separate devices. And the final way is with the VHS Decode Project, which is an RF capture. It captures the RF signal from the tape heads rather than using the ports at the back of a VHS player. It's a bit of a DIY project because you have to um, make some hardware changes to your VHS player. So going back to the question at the beginning of the video, do you need a line TBC and do you need a frame TBC? Well, you definitely need a line TBC because without a line TBC and with a particularly bad tape and perhaps not a great capture card, this is what your video might look like. Now, this is not every tape, obviously, but on particularly bad tapes, maybe tapes that were recorded in EP mode uh, or that are particularly old, you may get this. Now, the line TBC feature can be present in two devices, one of two devices. It can either be present in a Panasonic DVD recorder, the ES10 or ES15. And in that case, what you would do is send video from the VHS player to the Panasonic that has the line TBC superpower and then it flows down the line to either a frame TBC or if not a frame TBC then it goes right into a capture device. An alternate workflow is that you forget about that Panasonic recorder and instead you just get one of these SVHS players that has the line TBC feature built in. So that answers the first question. Should you buy a line TBC? The answer is yes. You need a line TBC. There's a lot of things people won't notice about your video. They're definitely gonna notice if it looks like this. Now, what about frame TBCs? What is a frame TBC? Well, let's look at this example. A frame of video heads over to a time-based corrector, and there's a couple of frames in there, and the time-based corrector releases it at exactly 29.97 seconds, releases it to the capture card. So the capture card is getting a nice even flow. That's what it wants, and as a result, you don't have any dropped frames, everything is flowing as it should. When you don't have a time-based corrector in between, there will be times when there isn't a frame available. There isn't a frame available, so the computer software has to duplicate a frame. Now let's actually look and see what does a drop frame really look like in practice. So here we are in Premiere, and you can see right here, the frame on the right has been duplicated. The one on the Feed on the left is a, a good a copy of the video that has no drop frames, but the one on the right has got some problems and you can see that the computer software is duplicating the frame so that there won't be like a blank space. But can you actually tell if there's a dropped frame? Watching this video on the right, it's got other problems, but I don't see any dropped frames. 
we see the flagging, and that'll be fixed with the line TBC, but we can't really see dropped frames. So what's the point of this? Well, we might see the effect of dropped frames, and the main effect of dropped frames is that the audio and video won't be in sync. So a frame time-based corrector can prevent this problem. But it's not the only way to deal with this problem. The more common way, frankly, that most people deal with this problem is by using the correct settings in virtual dub to deal with the fact that there are dropped frames. I wanted to see which settings worked best for my workflow. So in the example that I did, I used a regular Sony VHS player. I connected it to the ATI 600 and I sent that over to virtual dub 1911. The first settings I used, you can see on the screen, I checked dropped frames, I checked insert null frames, and on the resync mode area, I checked uh, sync audio to video by resampling the audio to a faster or slower rate. And I didn't check anything else. So the results were that after a four and a half hour video, there were zero dropped frames and 92 inserted frames or duplicated frames. But most important for me was that the audio and video was perfectly synchronized. So what that means to me is that virtual dub had an imperfect uh, video stream coming into it and it dealt with it. It dealt with it by duplicating some frames in exactly the right spot and then by doing something in the resync mode uh, to make sure that the audio and video stayed synchronized throughout four and a half hours. I did some other tests. I wanted to see what the automatically disable resync button does. And it turns out that when you're using a USB capture device, one that has the audio and the video going through it, if you check this box, it has the effect of undoing whatever you said in the resync mode area on top. So in other words, it's the equivalent of nothing. It's the equivalent of having no settings set up. And what I discovered was that after only an hour and a half, there was already 85 inserted frames, which, okay, that's, it is what it is. But the question is, how is the audio video synchronization? And what I discovered was, is that the audio was ahead by 19 frames after one hour. And I compared the, this version of the video to the sort of correct version of the video from the previous example, I laid them out in Premiere and I was able to see exactly how many frames one was ahead of the other. In my next test, I left uh, nothing checked in the resync mode, um, but I checked the box that said correct video timing for fewer uh, frames or dropped, drops or inserts. What I found is that after an hour and a half, there was 83 inserted frames. Okay, big deal. But again, the big question is, how was the audio video synchronization? And in this case, I saw that the audio was ahead by nine frames after one hour. I did one more test where I used my preferred setting, which was sync audio to video by resampling. And I also checked the, uh, the checkbox said correct video timing. I wanted to see what would happen if you use both of those. And it wasn't great, actually. It, it's um, whatever benefit I originally got from the first uh, radio button, sync audio to video, I lost it when I checked the, um, the option there, correct video timing. And you can see I was um, eight frames behind after one hour. So the conclusion of all this testing was, is that the uh, settings you see on the screen were best in the setup I was using, which was a VHS player going directly into an ATI TV Wonder, which is a USB device where the audio and the video go into that device. Um, and then it goes out to virtual dub using these parameters. I just want to take a step back and go back to this slide I showed you at the beginning. Of the digitization methods, we've been talking about the first one, and I told you that using the correct settings in virtual dub 1911, you can avoid dropped frames even if you don't have a frame TBC in the workflow. Now, there's another workflow you can use, which includes a mini DV camcorder. The camcorder acts as the kind of capture device. And when I did the same test with the same video, the same tape player, what I ended up with was four and a half hours of video with no audio video problems. Everything was in sync. 
WinDV reported 22 dropped frames. I'm not sure if those dropped frames are equivalent to the dropped frames that VirtualDub reported. I, I don't even know how I can figure that out because I'd have to be able to find the drop frames in a four and a half hour video. I'm never going to find it. So I, I'm not sure actually how it um, deals with dropped frames. If it shows, for example, a black screen, if it duplicates the frame. If you know the answer, please leave a comment. I'm, I'm curious to know. But the bottom line is that if you use the mini DV camcorder method, you will end up with a video that is perfectly in sync. As for the other methods, I'm actually not sure what would happen if you used a retro tink. Five. I don't know if it would keep everything in sync or not. I guess it would because I haven't heard anything to the contrary on the videos I've watched about it. I'm almost certain that the tape player with the built-in recorder is not going to give you any audio video synchronization issues. And the VHS Decode project works in a different way and everything gets synced up in the end once the audio and video is merged at the end. So the question at the beginning was, should you buy a Frame TBC? That question actually depends not just on whether or not the Frame TBC works, which it does. It depends on how much money you have to spend on this hobby or this business. If you have the money to spend, go for it. But it is a lot. And here are some prices I found of a DVK unit and of a TBC 1000 unit. Now, these are prices for uh, June 2024. But setting aside the should I buy it question, I think there are three other questions that I need to answer. First is, does the frame TBC prevent dropped frames? And the answer is yes, it absolutely does prevent dropped frames. I did a test with the same workflow where I used my DVK and you can see the results on the screen, a lot fewer dropped frames. So it definitely works. The second question is, is it better to prevent dropped frames than to deal with dropped frames after the fact. And yeah, it is better. It's better to prevent the problem in the first place. There's no question about that. But the final question is, is it worth between 700 to 2000 US to buy this device? Well, that's gonna depend on your budget. It's gonna depend how many tapes you think you're gonna be doing. Depends on whether you think you'd be able to resell this frame TBC later on for the whole value or most of the value. But what I hope I was able to show in this video is that you can get by without a frame TBC. You will get dropped frames. The dropped frames themselves won't be noticeable. The effects of dropped frames might be noticeable unless you use the correct settings. I plan on doing a lot more comparison videos. So if you have suggestions for other comparisons you would like to see, I will try to do it. Just leave a comment. And as always, if you want to press the thumbs up button, that would be awesome because people with our crazy hobby will be able to find this video more easily if you alert them to the fact that this video wasn't terrible.